Hey YouTube, welcome back to another History Teacher Reacts video with Mr. Terry as I continue my search for historical knowledge here on the internet. Alright, Merry Christmas to everybody. I thought it would be appropriate that we do some kind of Christmas related video. And this one caught my eye from one of my favorite channels, Extra Credits. And that is on the World War I Christmas truce um, that happened towards the beginning of the war. And it's something I've heard about um, and know that it happened, but I'm interested to know a little bit about how it came to be. And uh, a little more detail on it. I know there's like like the, the famous events where they um, were like the French and Germans like played soccer in no man's land and stuff like that. And we know too that as it being early in the war, you know, people still didn't understand how big and long term devastating this war would be. So you don't see that too much later in the war. Uh, but interesting to see this kind of play out at the beginning of the war. So this is in two parts. We're going to check out part number one right now. Stay tuned for part number two. Um, and let's go ahead and get started. So Extra Credits is one of my yeah favorite series, like I said. Um, if you have not subbed to them or liked their video, especially this video right here, go down in the description below and give them a like and subscribe. They really deserve it. All right, let's go ahead and jump into the video. Uh, World War One Christmas truce, Silent Night. Let's check Christmas it out. Eve, 1914. The First war year of the was war. supposed to be over by now. Yeah. People had no idea that they thought this would be a short thing. Um, you know, the war just started about three, four, four months in, um, and and uh, it has no signs of stopping. So that was very upsetting uh, to people. So, but you could see how the mood is uh, here different, even to have something like this um, when you know later in the war with the devastation, that's that's not going to be the case. This little holiday special is brought to you by World of Tanks. Use the invite code ARMISTICE if you're a new player who wants to check out the game. Cool, cool. The Christmas truce is one of the most poignant events of the First World War, a time when men rose up above the madness of the conflict and, for just a moment, saw each other as fellow humans. This is an event that definitely did happen. Thousands of men laid down arms in the truce, but a century of retellings has also kind of sanded down its rough edges I'm and sure. oversimplified its messy reality. Indeed, core, it's it's got to be. I mean, something like this, it's gonna be, it, it, it's gonna be, yeah, watered down and dramatized because it is such an uh, you know interesting story of these of bitter rivals putting down their sides for the sake of Christmas or something like that. So, yeah, hopefully we do hear what well, you know what really happened. Indeed, this event wasn't just the result of pure human spirit and holiday cheer. It was a host of unique factors that drove these enemies to spontaneously declare peace in no man's land. And really, it may not have been all that spontaneous. Small armistices were happening every day. As yeah. frontline troops became accustomed to the rhythms of trench warfare, they learned that looking the other way now and then could bring a shred of safety and calm to their lives. The armies ate meals at the same time, which became a daily ceasefire. Patrols frequently ignored each other, adopting a live and let live attitude. You know, war in the in the classical sense, and what I mean by classical, especially before World War One, had so many unwritten rules and unwritten expectations of things. Like you don't fight in this condition and do this and this time and stuff like that. And you only use these things and stuff like that. The World War One eventually will change all that, and now there's just very few rules, you know, anymore um, about this. It's about victory, you know, no matter what the cost is. But that wasn't that wasn't the classical view of war. Often, troops often shouted to each other across the lines. After all, the autumn battles had passed, and both sides were waiting out the winter. In reality, the weather was the primary enemy for both sides. The high water table at Flanders meant that the trenches were always filling with water, Ugh. sometimes collapsing and burying men inside. Soldiers leaned against the walls to sleep, trying to keep themselves out of the wet. Food supplies had to be hung up on dugout ceilings. And that winter had been particularly miserable. Weeks of rain flooded the dugouts. The mud pulled men down like quicksand. Now, British Field Marshal Sir John French had noticed the hands-off attitude his men were developing towards the enemy, and so he ordered attacks in late December to boost morale. And this resulted in heavy British losses. Concerned about possible fraternity- Doesn't sound like much of a moral boost, huh? 
organization over the holiday, he issued orders that no unofficial armistice would be tolerated. Morale was much better over in the German trenches. After all, they were winning. But many men were also experiencing their first holiday away from home. Knowing that this would be difficult, commanders brought Christmas to the trenches, shipping thousands of presents to the field. Each man received a gift from the Kaiser. Cigar boxes for NCOs, a pipe with the crown prince on it for the ranks. The British, for their part, received a brass box from Princess Mary filled with cigarettes, tobacco, a Christmas card, and sweets. And okay. then there were personal packages. Enterprises sprang up on the home front, offering family members a chance to send gift boxes to the troops. Brit Not a lot of people realize how close the front of the war was. Like, it could just be, like, if you're in Paris or something, it's just like, hey, it's over there. You can, you can see the explosions, you know, it's over there. Uh, it's not like this big, like, on the other side of the world type of thing. Your letters could get there quick, and you're reading a newspaper that at most is a day old, you know. Um, a lot of times people, again, have this, this, like, shipping off to war thing is this, like, far away, long thing of disconnection. That's really not the case in World War One. It's right in their front yard. British soldiers received plum puddings and thousand-count boxes of cigarettes. German and Austrian troops were bombarded with chocolate and salami and cognac. Both sides received winter clothing. In truth, though, the gifts were kind of a nuisance. I mean, there was nowhere to put it all. Soldiers didn't have a place to store a thousand extra cigarettes. But that Christmas Eve delivered a true gift. The rain stopped, and the trenches drained. Dry cold froze the mud into a hard surface, almost like a floor. Snow dusted the countryside. Sounds awful. <laughs> that afternoon, the gunfire dwindled, and in some sectors it stopped entirely. The weather just seemed too nice for it. The Germans, stuffed with Christmas chocolate and cheered by the weather, started putting lit Tannenbaum up on their trench parapets. And then, the German line started singing. Over on the British parapets, watchmen of the Scots Guard saw lines of lights along the enemy trench. At first, they suspected an attack, but then they heard an ethereal sound drifting across no man's land. Stille Nacht, Heilige Nacht. The Silent original night. Austrian version of Silent Night. So they, they're putting up Christmas lights and singing Christmas songs. Okay. <laughs> Sensing a challenge, Guards Officer Lieutenant Sir Edward Hulse decided that they should drown this out with their own carol. The sides went back and forth, <laughs> but soon the competition merged into a harmony of Good King Wenceslas and Old Lang Syne. The men began shouting Christmas greetings across the line, jokingly at first. A few even stepped out to talk. Hulse didn't know it, but the same thing was happening up and down the entire British line. It's amazing. You would never think this, right? Uh, that this could be possible, even if it is at the beginning of a new war, right? The the, the French German animosity goes way back before World War One. I. I mean, they were on the brink of war, fighting almost multiple times in the 1900s before World War One even came out. But it does show too that, like, like you, when you're talking about okay, there's animosity between the Germans and the French. When you break that down to a personal level of a personal individual right it's very different right you have that person and their reasons for being there on their upbringing and there's much more of a personal connection than the abstract idea of germany versus france right and the history that goes on these are still young men that are still unaware of what's about to happen okay coming down in the in the, the, the coming months and stuff like that and very naive um to be honest but yeah, agreements formed. If you if you want to know more about kind of that, uh, how how war on an individual level is is different, um, especially World War One, um, read or watch the, the the film adaptations of All Quiet on the Western Front, um, where it gets into that quite a bit. In some sectors, the officers met at the wire and shook hands, agreeing to cease hostilities the next day. In other areas, the ranks took the lead. Germans shouting across no man's land, English, tomorrow if you no shoot, we no shoot. At times, it was just one brave soul walking into no man's land, waving a newspaper. Hmm. These overtures were extremely dangerous. Though peace was breaking oh, out well, in certain yeah, areas, you don't go no it man's didn't land. happen everywhere. 
One British regiment responded to German caroling with a machine gun blast. Some unarmed soldiers yeah. were gunned down trying to broker this holiday armistice. I would I was going to say there's no way this happened on the entire front. The front's huge, right? That everyone is going to feel the same. There's no way. But that's you know, seems pretty tragic there. But in most sectors, the ceasefire held. This truce mostly happened between German and British units. The French and the Belgians, whose countries were under German occupation, were less inclined. Makes sense. You know, and I was saying German and French hostilities, and yeah, I'm glad they were focusing it into specific, yeah, fronts. Um, with that, like, the French have a lot bigger beef with, beef with the Germans than, say, the British do, right? Because they're, the Germans are actually invading France, and they're right there in their backyard. There were agreements to bury the dead and cease hostilities, but not as much fraternization. Yet, a Bavarian unit held fire during a French mass, and both sides halted fighting long enough for a guest, a soloist from the Paris Opera, to make a performance. British Indian troops, who were a bit unfamiliar with this whole Christmas deal, saw the lit German trees and thought of their own holiday of Diwali. They held fire, but also held position, until some Germans tempted them out of the trenches with cigars and cigarettes. Soon the men... Yeah, um, a lot of people don't know that a big chunk of the British military was actually there um, from their, their colonies, specifically from India, who fought in enormous numbers um, in supplying that. It's why this war is also a war of um, imperialism and utilizing imperial resources. And a lot of that was them, you know, yeah, using using conscripted soldiers and, and soldiers in general from your colonies and make up big, big chunks of it. And we're smoking together on the parapet. That Christmas night, the troops slept in sublime quiet. Christmas Day dawned bright and cold, the sky clear for the first time in weeks. To their shock, British troops looked across no man's land to see the Germans walking around on their parapets. Such a thing was suicidal in daylight, and that yeah, gesture of trust, more than anything, lured a few British out. It was heaven to at last stand up straight and walk on solid earth. Some had ventured into no man's land on Christmas Eve, but in daylight it was impossible to ignore the bodies lying between the trenches. Ooh. The two sides buried their dead in common graves, grieving side by side in joint services, listening to the faraway sounds of battle from other sectors. And that shared experience broke down the wall. Soldiers milled about together in no man's land, swapping over abundant gifts from home. British beef for uniform buttons, chocolate cake for barrels of beer. They exchanged hats. One German barber gave haircuts. The men chatted. <laughs> After all, they shared so much in common. They lived in the same fields under the same rain, and they were equally sick of war. Besides, they were curious. What was life like on the other side? Sure. Who were these enemies? One British officer was perplexed to learn that his new German friend believed the armies of the Kaiser fought for freedom. That was impossible, the officer responded. We're fighting for freedom. <laughs> Amid this... Classic misunderstanding. Everyone's fighting for freedom. Well, yeah. No, everyone is fighting for freedom. That's what they always say about war and how you motivate for war. You're, you're literally fighting for the fr your freedom and the freedom of your nation and stuff like that. But they're like, wait. Wait, this doesn't add up. We can't both be fighting for freedom, right? Yep. The irony, right? Lieutenant Hulse found himself talking to Lieutenant Thomas of the 15th Westphalians, who had something to pass on. A Victoria Cross and a packet of letters. An English officer had died in the German trench during the last attack. Perhaps he could give these to the man's family? Touched, Hulse removed his own silk scarf, a gift from home, and presented it in thanks. Thomas, embarrassed that he had nothing to give in return, sent a soldier to fetch the fur gloves that his family had sent. Up and down the line, men started bringing out footballs. Kickabouts broke out, with men from both sides chasing the ball among shell holes and sliding on the frozen ground. <laughs> In one sector, a group of Highlanders challenged a Saxon regiment, who burst out laughing whenever a kilt flew up during play. But not all of this activity was goodwill. On both sides, a few used the gatherings oh. to reconnoiter enemy trenches, and both sides used the time to repair dugouts. Ah. Oh. Dirty tactics, right? They're as they're going and having this free range through no man's land. They're out map mapping out the enemy trench 
layout and all this stuff, right? Yeah, but you're going to have those people that, of course, are still just right down to business, you know. Of course, for some, this fraternization appeared false. One British soldier flashed his squad mate a hidden dagger, while another refused to smoke German cigarettes, fearing that they might be poisoned. When one squad of Bavarians I mean, discussed... I mean, wouldn't you be suspicious with this? I mean, at least at some point, at somewhat, you'd be suspicious of this? I know I would be. Right? Is this a trap, you know? You never know with war. You never know, because you're dealing with your life. ...whether to meet the British, their corporal snapped at them. Such a thing should not happen in wartime. Have you no German sense of honor left at all? They weren't surprised. The night before, the same soldier had refused to join the unit's Christmas service. So it, it, a lot of it is a generational difference. The young people are a lot more naive to this, and these older, more seasoned people, just, they, they know the, 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 the risks involved that the younger people are not considering. Corporal Hitler was odd like that. But his disapproval reflected the general's view. This was exactly the situation that Field Marshal French had feared. Commanders dispatched senior officers to threaten disciplinary action and insist that the men restart the war. In some sectors, the armistice came to an orderly close. Officers from both sides saluted and fired revolvers into the air, signaling that, all right, the war was back on. In a few places, troops resisted until nearly to New Year's Eve but the generals would not have it. Yeah, you'd wonder if this would just bring in a sense of like, hey, we don't need to fight. This is dumb. Like, why can't we just be peaceful like this and have a good time and live with each other and learn from each other and all that? You'd think there'd be people that would just, you know, like it, it could change their attitudes. Of course it doesn't, which is, you know, a shame that way. That it's going to result in the bloodiest war that had ever taken place. German command dispatched snipers to break the ceasefire. French ordered an artillery barrage, letting the machinery of war roll over the human connections of the frontline troops. Nothing like this Christmas truce would happen again. The generals wouldn't allow it. On Christmas Eve 1915, British officers ordered a 24-hour artillery barrage. Men who tried to form a truce were court-martialed. Wow. Machine guns drowned out German carols. But the generals needn't have bothered. The spirit of that truce was unique to 1914, a symptom of a young war. Yeah. By Christmas 1915, those troops had experienced chlorine gas and creeping bombardments. Zeppelins were bombing London. The Battle of Verdun would end just before the holiday, leaving 750,000 casualties. Verdun. I remember we, you know, doing a, doing a video for Verdun, um, talking about how, yeah, the casualties, 750,000 casualties in such a small area. And I remember we did the math with the viewers about deaths per acre and how, like, absurd it was, the death for every meter or something. Like, it's, it's absurd. So, yeah, I mean, you can tell that there's... How can you do a Christmas truce just in the wake of that? You, you can't, right? The war has changed everything. Please. Indeed, many of the men who celebrated in no man's land that day would never see another Christmas. Yeah. One of those unlucky ones was Lieutenant Sir Edward Hulse, who had sung carols and given a German officer his silk scarf. He died three months later while trying to save a wounded comrade. He was 25. And yet, Hulse is not remembered today for his military achievements, or even the book of letters that his friends published after his death. He and so many others are remembered for a victory entirely their own, when a group of brave men ventured into the line of fire, trusting their enemies not to shoot, and believing that humanity was better than the bonfire it had built for Easier itself. Easier said than done, huh? Happy holidays, everybody. Awesome. Yeah, um... Yeah, interesting story, uh, just to, to hear about that, that that it could exist. I knew that it was early in the war, and there's, I mean, you can see why. There's no way this is going to happen later. The war was new, people were still naive, um, and, you know, eventually as this war goes on, you're, you're not going to, you're not going to feel like celebrating with your enemy after there's been a time period where everyone you've gone you you've grown grown close to in the war has been killed right and it's going to change your attitude you want the war to be over you don't look at the enemy the same way because they're killing people that you've grown attached to which is of course the nature of war 
um, with that. But it does show, I think, again, up up until that, or with with that Christmas truce, the changing nature of war in general, right? You don't see those type of things in modern war um, anymore. And and that's why the war, you know, World War One, not the war to end all wars, but the war to change all wars is definitely something I believe. War will never be the same. And just from the the conceptual point of view of war, of um, it's not glorious, right? And and historical historically, war has has been it was seen that way a lot by a lot of people because there were so many of these unwritten rules that made war more humanized in a way. Um, again, with all these unwritten rules and stuff that you don't do, and there's far more comfort, comfort, comforting moments in war. I guess that's not maybe a great way to explain it, but um, that all gets stripped away with World War One. There's no, I mean, they were saying, I forget who said it, it's like there's, you know, they uh, you've been brought up to believe the, of the glory of war and the greatness of war um, with someone saying there's no, there's no glory or honor sitting in a trench, a freezing trench waiting to be blown up. There's not the glorious cavalry charges and you get your enemy to retreat and there's all this movement and lot of successful moments, right? Yeah, they they said there's there's no war. There's no there's yeah, there was no glory in how World War 1 was fought. Um so anyway, all right, well, looking forward to the the second part I saw that they have. So we'll check that out. Um, I'll uh, get this, get that out soon as we're here in the Christmas season. Uh, Merry Christmas to everybody that celebrates Christmas um, here around the world. Thank you to everybody um, for being a part of this community. Again, if you like this original video, and I'm sure you know about extra credits, but if you don't, at the very least, you need to give them a like. I'll put a link in the description down below to uh, to their um, to their video. So definitely do that. They're big supporters of this channel. So. Um, Please give them the the, the the praise that they deserve because they do awesome work there. All right, if you haven't subbed to my channel, I'd love to have you around and be a part of the community, be a be a familiar face. Um, get involved in our Discord server, which uh, link is down below. Also links to Patreon if you'd like to support the channel that way and get access to polls and other potential benefits for supporting this channel. But first and foremost, just thank you for being here, and we'll see you soon. Bye.